This podcast contains adult language, descriptions of violence, sexual references, and other possibly offensive themes. Listener discretion is advised. Oh, I'm not connected to the internet, it says. Or what? <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> what is happening? Uh. You are projecting your voice into our minds directly. Oh man, did I finally learn sending? So, welcome to the second ever episode of The Bonfire Fables, where the cast of Back to the Story sit down, answer questions, and tell some stories. Uh, my name is Alexander, I play Amps and Arms Blossom, and returning to join me again are Nyessa and Swan, who play Ellery and Vesper, respectively. Also here are Michael, who plays Calvin for the first time, George, who plays Ezekiel for the first time, our beloved DM Klaus. And special guest Dale Kingsmill is joining us yet again. Thank you for coming to hang out with us. I, I, you guys know that you're doing me a favor, right? Like, <laughs> this is me getting to hang out and have fun. Uh, well, we all enjoy each it's other's a, company. It's Let's put it that beneficial. way. <laughs> well, thank you for having me, and thank you for accepting the invitation. So, basically, uh, just to quickly go over the format of today. Uh, we got a ton of questions, in case you haven't looked at it. Uh, most of them are from listeners. Some of them we thought of ourselves, and we're going to see what stories we get out of them. Just hanging out, talking, and asking each other questions, and uh, things like that. Uh, we probably won't get through all of them, but that's okay. We'll save them for next time we do this. So if you want to ask any like follow-up questions to any, anything anybody's talking about, feel free. Uh, this is more of a conversation kind of thing rather than sitting here interviewing each other. All right, we can get started. I guess um, start us off. Let's kind of start way back at the beginning. And I would like to ask all of you, how did you get into tabletop RPGs in the first place? Nias and I answered last time, so it's up to, <laughs> up to the rest of you guys. Uh, Klaus, why don't you start us off? Because I'm curious. <laughs> uh, well, mine started, like I suppose, a lot of people's. I watched Critical Role. I watched the first episode, Enter Greg Hammer, and I saw all these friends having fun and playing these characters and ripping off of each other, and I saw Mercer jumping between guards, drunken crowds, bar patrons, bar owners, animals, and I thought, I could do that. And then the next week, I made a Roll20 account, and I could not do that, but I've been <laughs> slowly improving since then. But I, before that, I played a lot of like Elder Scrolls, role-playing games, and it was always the narrative and immersion, I think, that got me. I don't think I knew those terms at the time, but that's what I liked. And so when I watched them, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to play. So, it's the true so. nerd experience. It is. You know? It is. <laughs> For me, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether I can think of, like, the first time I went, ooh, role-play games on a tabletop. That's for me. <laughs> but I definitely, like, I have, I come from a, like, pure nerd family every single member is a total dweeb uh so things like my brother used to play tabletop rpgs like rogue trader with his warhammer group they met with weekly so i was probably introduced to the concept through something like that and then just very slowly over time it drip fed into something bigger where like um when when i first started on the geek and sundry vlogs channel there was really briefly a discussion of starting a live play game with them and doing like a couple of one shots with the other vloggers uh, and that never came to anything, but it just like planted a seed. And then later on, talking with uni friends, uh, D and D came up, and they were like, "Oh yeah, that seems that seems like a cool concept. I think I would like doing that." And so then when Critical Role came out, and I was I was there for the first episode as well, and I was like, "This is it. I can show them this, and they'll get it, and then they'll really want to play." And uh, then I tricked them into playing for my birthday, and the rest <laughs> is history. That's uh -huh. my favorite part: tricking people into a hobby. Yeah. That's pretty great. Yeah, it's important. It's how you really make friends, is manipulation. Klaus, can I follow up on yours real quick? Was, no. uh, okay. 
that first Western game that you had posted on Roll20, where you were like, this is a game by critters for critters. Was that the first one that you ever DM'd? Yeah. And played? Okay. Yeah, that was specifically for newbies. So all Uh, the players didn't know what they were doing. I didn't know what we were doing. (laughs) Sorry about that. I don't know how I (laughs) infiltrated that. I I am still like, I can't believe I played Druid and that's what you guys did. That was actually the second session I ever ran. I ran one before that with none of you guys. And it was really bad because I was like, you guys are standing on a dock and the waves are coming in. And none of their characters had anything to do with docks or seafaring because I didn't know what the characters were. And they were just like, I was like, what do you do? And they were like, I, I, I don't know. Like, there's a ship and it, like, it's going to take you somewhere. Did you get on it? Oh, my god! <laughs> it was really bad. <laughs> Um, oh, I love it. It was really bad. I tried, but it didn't work out very well. The first time I sat down to play a character, I was like, I don't know how to get anywhere. I have to go to this location. How do I do it? I don't know what that is. It never occurred to me just to say I go to the library. Like I talked about uh, last time briefly, and then I'll let George and Michael continue, but uh, that, that campaign was my first time playing D&D, and that was where I met. Klaus and Michael and Roger, and we've all just kind of been stuck together ever since, and it's very lucky. And I still am amazed, and to be sappy for a moment, I always kind of think of Ezekiel's line in um, the Jekyll and Hyde, where he's like, you know, look at all of us here together, how is that anything but fate? And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, that's so Swan's corny. the mushy one of the group. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> um, I actually first played a long time ago. I My brothers were really into it, and they were a lot older than me. They're like 17 and 12 years older than me. So when I was 10 years old, they had been playing like a monthly D&D game with their friends. So my brother made me like my own. He didn't want me to play with his friends, so he just let me do it with him. So at 10 years old, I created in uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, which was second edition, created the half-elven thief mage, Zembe, um, who didn't do... I I think we got, like, three sessions. I had no idea how to play. I forgot I was a spellcaster. I was, like, a multi-class and severely disadvantaged because of that. And I always... Like, I just wore armor, and I was like, oh, I can't... In that version, you can't spellcast at all in it. So it was like, "Mm." I really had no idea I was playing. And then I dropped away for it for a long time uh, until I started watching Critical Role. I was a little bit late. Um, and then I managed to convince one of my friends to play with me. And then I got a couple more. And then everybody moved. So I turned to Roll20. And after a couple really terrible matchups, I found the previous Northville campaign that had been hanging with Klaus for about two years now? More than that. Yeah, like two or three? Yeah, because that first one was a while. And then... I popped yeah. into the other one that you guys were playing, and then Swan came into that one. So, good times. We started. I think this group together started in February of 2016. Oh my God, you're <laughs> Quite frankly, it is unfair how quickly all of you got so good at D and D. If that's when you started, <laughs> that's not allowed. Well, you meant to suck for a long time first. I've always been. I mean, I'm not to be. You know. I'm amazing, but yeah, I came to it as a writer and as someone who's done theater and taken improv classes and things like that. So I think that was kind of my background, which is why a lot of my early characters have novels and backgrounds, backstories, because I'm always like, mm. I came to it as a writer to be like, oh, well, I have to know everything. Obviously, I have to figure out all of these little details. I'm like, I don't actually. I just have to have a concept that I can give to the DM. I learned in high school, and that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> yeah, me too. There's some experience. I um I was really bad, but I forced my players to fill out questionnaires after each session. There's only four questions, but I was very um purposeful about trying not to be so bad at it. I'm still figuring it out. I hey, think Michael. you just mispronounced good DM. It's bad is too short. I thought you were gonna say pork cutlass. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> pork cutlass. Oh. oh Lord. The best that part is that it, the best part is that you say port cutlass in the summary at the beginning of thirty eight too. Time. It's beautiful. Okay, Michael, I, what's your story? Huh? Oh no, 
Uh, I start, the first time I played Dungeons and Dragons was also with Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, probably around 95. Uh, I had a friend's older sister's boyfriend kind of introduce us. And we played once and it was like, oh, that's cool. I, I did not hang out with a lot of nerdy, geeky, I mean, I just, I mean, my family, my dad's kind of a jock and I had two sisters, so they didn't hang out with me. D and D was never something that I uh, that I really got into, but it's like something I did once upon a time. I didn't really get into it until Fourth Edition came out, and Penny Arcade helped roll it out with Chris Perkins for Ack Inc. And that's what really inspired me to go out and find a group to, to play with. When that group finally dissolved around the, around Critical Role and Fifth Edition coming out, is when I jumped on or Roll20 and met Klaus. I think Michael was maybe the first. Is he or Michael or Roger? I think it's Michael. Uh, Roger came in like a session. Like a session after, I think? Yeah. Yeah. Long time buddies. <clears throat> uh, my story is kind of, kind of a middle of the road between a lot of other people's. I started much like George when I was quite young, like nine or ten. And, uh, I started because my dad played second edition AD&D in high school. And so one day, uh, my brother and I and my dad are like at home doing nothing and we have nothing to do. So my dad's like, Hey guys, I got this game that I used to play in high school. And so we rolled up. I played a half elf wizard and my brother played a half orc fighter that was reskinned as a lizard man. And we went through about an hour of the Ruins of Undermountain box set for second edition AD&D. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. That was my first time. That's uh, where we, That was why we got my first dice set, which I still have. And then after that, I tried to get a group going once fourth edition kind of came out in high school. But it didn't work because A is fourth edition. B, I only had the player's handbook. And none of the other fourth edition books, and C, all of them wanted to play Chaotic Evil. So that didn't work. <laughs> Fast forward into university, where I met a couple of other people who were really into it, and this other guy started DMing a three and a half uh, edition game. That group dissolved, and then I started a Pathfinder game the following year. And I've been playing regularly ever since, uh, two to three games a week. So. To quickly reiterate my story, yeah, I also had a very nerdy family, uh, my dad specifically, and he talked about playing D&D as a kid and whatever, and then, you know, you see it in movies and shows and stuff, and um, I got the fourth edition bread box, and that, that never went where I tried to, like, run a game for my family, and I was, like, 13, 14, so I just, I had no idea what I was doing, and we were all, like, I, <laughs> it was just such a a slog we didn't get through like even an hour and then i kind of put it down for a while uh titan's grave was airing on peak and sundry and i started watching that and went oh oh this is neat and then from that started watching crit roll but i took the fantasy age setting from titan's grave and i was running that for some friends that i have in my only in-person friends <laughs> ran it for them and um then watching Kurt Will went, oh, man, I really want to do this. Man, I really, really want to do this. Hopped on a Roll20, happened to find a game that said, hey, this is for critters. And it was Bosnus first. Okay. I got very lucky. We were still figuring stuff out. I like uh, that you tried to teach or play with your family because I did the same with my brother and his girlfriend <laughs> recently. And they wanted nothing to do with the cultists attacking the town. They left that. They didn't care. <laughs> But the slot that just, uh, I was just introducing them to combat mechanics. The slot tadpole up on the road, they captured it and tried to tame it. And that was what the entire session was, which was at, at the time I was like, what are you guys doing? But then looking back, that's Pete and D&D. That's, <laughs> that's what it's all about. The DM <laughs> setting something forward. So you can say that what you were wanting to say. Uh, you were quiet. No, I, uh, I was going to say that the, I love playing with people who have no idea how to play sometimes because they will just go for random things because they don't know what the rules are like can i do this 
And sometimes it just works out beautifully of like, no, we don't really care about that, but here's this random thing. Yeah. Peak D D is like the DM setting something forward and the player is going, Nope. That's a good point that George said too. Like new players don't know the rules well enough to like optimize their actions and choices. So instead of attacking with the greatsword, they like pick up the sk- the skull of the skeleton they just slain and throw it. It does like one D four damage, but you know what? That's way cooler. It's way cooler. I think that's one of the things about Critical Role that they do is because they've been playing for years, yet it still seems like half of them don't have any idea what the hell is happening most of the time. <laughs> Which is also me. Every Sunday night. <laughs> I think it's all of us a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, it sounds like I think this is how it works. Next question. I think Nyasa <laughs> didn't answer. Oh, Nyasa. Oh, that's right. Uh, well, I did answer last time we had this question, but I can go over it a little bit again. For those of you who didn't hear it, because you weren't here. So, I was always kind of aware of D&D since maybe high school or so, but didn't really have any opportunities to play. And I always role-played any video game that I played, including and starting with Oregon Trail in the third grade. Wow. So, oh, gee. So I, I, was, I kind of had that mindset of, like, getting into a character, getting into the story, even when there wasn't a story there. But I developed some really bad associations with D&D specifically for a really long time. And so I never played it. And in fact, I avoided it at all costs up until Serafina got me watching Critical Role. And then a friend of mine in person offered to run a game for me. And I got Serafina and another friend into that. I should be saying Swan. That's me. I'm Serafina. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so I, I got I got Swan and another char- uh, another friend, another character into that, and they created a space that was safe enough for me to feel comfortable playing. And Which from is there, just I so was hooked. super important. Yeah, because before then, even when I felt like maybe I could get past these bad associations and try playing. It still didn't feel safe for me to go out to any of the like local events or find a local group because I didn't really know who I could trust. Yeah. And I and there was the possibility of certain people being there who I did not want to associate with. So being able to find people that I could play with safely was just so vital to being able to get into this game that has now become one of the most important things in my life. So, yeah. Hearts. I saw it around. <laughs> They're doing the heart symbol um, for yeah. the podcast. Yeah, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Touching back on Dale's thing, doing the leap hop of, you know, my whole, like, well, I, I was an actor, I did improv and stuff too. I also, as a writer and as a kid, this was always very imaginative. And very often, as an only child who didn't have a lot of other kids in the neighborhood, and then his brother came along when I was on, when I was already seven. I often played by myself and played pretend and everything. So I was very used to ridiculously and dramatically acting out <laughs> random scenes and characters all on my lonesome. Oh, that you know, explains a few things. And, <laughs> yeah, epic villain speeches and, you know, heroes fighting, whatever ridiculousness as a child. And so I think it's very easy for that to come into now playing D&D and... It's yeah, yeah a safe that, space is very helpful. <laughs> that was definitely something I should have anticipated because I I mean I said before that I tricked my uni friends into playing with me, but they, I I studied theater at university. So it's a group of like seven it's it seven or eight players. Uh only one of them is a guy and only two of them aren't theater kids. So it's just like a mess of ridiculous over the top like voices and actions and everything. And I I think that really does go a long way to creating a space where you feel like you're not going to make an idiot of yourself, like even on that lower level of safety, because that is something that I think really stops people from getting into D&D. And it shouldn't because you're in a group of people who are there to have fun. And I think a key part of that is being willing to look like an idiot. Absolutely. And I think that's... That's the thing that I've had to learn and work on the most as a player is being willing to 
do something a little bit out there, do something riskier than I would actually do as a normal human being. Even looking so. at our group, though, when we started, you know, and very few of us had character voices. We were all just kind of very, you know, playing D&D with these strangers that we just met. And then we stopped like a big campaign and kind of had a lull where we were like, was it just Brandon's or was it that and the cursed Lost Minds of Handelver game in between um, when yeah. we then started yeah. Yildran? But I remember we came back. Oh, no, we had taken the yeah the hiatus for Yildran and did one of the other players had run a, a short campaign. And in that, we're like, well, we have no risk and we've been playing together for a long time. And so we all started doing these like dumb character voices and things. And um, by the time we came back, we were like, yeah, you know what? We can do these ridiculous, silly things and nobody has in this group is judging us and that was i think the moment where we realized we were all in like a, a safe space you know when we started doing these accents and these like silly ridiculous over-the-top characters for i think it was actually for a couple one shots and then we settled on that short campaign and, and so by the time we came back we were like oh we can take risks and we can uh well yeah sometimes we judge michael <laughs> i was just about to say i <laughs> To be fair, I judge everybody. I just keep it quiet most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things I've had to struggle with is I'm, I've generally been kind of a boisterous dick to a lot of people. <laughs> um, I made fun of people in high school. I'm a horrible person. Um, it's, I don't know. It's what I do, especially when I get nervous. So I've had to kind of tone stuff down. I've had to learn how to be a little bit more approachable. So. Hey, you're one of our favorite people in this group, so okay. says something. Uh, I guess next question, it ties into this, and some of us kind of alluded to it before, but Lost Whitlock on Twitter asks, what was the first character you ever played? Oh, memories. I think I'm hearing I... the people that are playing a while, the first. <laughs> I'm interested in these answers. I think the side yeah. the... Hilariously enough, the halfling rogue that I made with that D and D uh, edition box set. Of course, it was a rogue. <laughs> no <laughs> my surprises. First, right, my first actual character was uh, was Ira, um, with you guys, uh, my human druid, who was very short lived. <laughs> my mine already said it was that half elf wizard that I played in second edition A D and D that I don't even remember his name because that was like fourteen years ago. Uh, and I said mine, Zembe. I only remember it because I named a Neopet after him. <laughs> oh, wow. That's oh, yeah, my that's long favorite. I love you ever so said. much right I now. You. <laughs> God, we're going to have to talk Neopets at some point. <laughs> oh, so many poor creatures for still starving. Just out there. <laughs> Take comfort. Neopets never die. Pour one out for all the loops I abandoned. <laughs> Uh, my character was, it was, his name was Bowen McLeod, based off of, uh, I stole the name from yeah, Dragonheart, which, it. yeah, I was obsessed with, uh, Dragonheart. It was one of my favorite movies growing up. He was just a standard fighter because the way it was explained to me, at least in second edition ADD, you can't be a paladin if you're not a human, lawful good, and like, you have, like, my dungeon master, I guess, made me take this stupid test, like verbal, like, hey, what would you do in this situation if a red dragon told you that you had to kill yourself to save the princess? What would you do? And it was like, fool, you can't trust a red dragon. So it's like, I don't, I don't know. I'll just be a fighter. <laughs> wow. Great that sounds like a great DM. <laughs> we played once, so. Boom, cloud. Mm. Oh, boy. I'm gonna. There has to be an NPC now named Boone McLeod that comes in. I'm gonna make him a dwarf, though, a dwarf paladin. I mean, you'll have to wait and find out. <laughs> oh, uh, my first character uh, was Klaus White Strike. Yeah, he was a uh, farm boy fighter. He used a pitchfork as a weapon and had some plow parts that were bent into a breastplate. Just have to pay your respects. And he died, just like all of my characters. My first character was a dwarven cleric by the name of Angherid Leatherfoot, also known as Harry, but you have to pronounce her name correctly or else she will grumble a lot. It's like the only thing that annoys her is people mispronouncing her name. But she was a, a cleric of Desna because we were originally talking about playing Pathfinder, 
before we decided on D&D. And I had already kind of built my character concept around that. So she was fun. I miss her. I feel like I'm only familiar with the Pathfinder deities, if I'm honest. Like, you say Desna, and I'm like, yep, got it. I know who we're talking about if you list anyone from D&D. Nothing. I've got nothing. I don't know. The D&D pantheon changes with every edition. I, I can't even keep up with it now. Then you get that section in the back of the book that's like, hey, here are the Norse gods, and that just stresses me out. Dale, who's just your first character? I, think. I can't even imagine that. Like, <laughs> my uh, my first character was, he was a known rogue slash wizard. Uh, and he, he basically the concept was that he was kind of a huckster street magician um, who just kind of did fake little, like, illusion trick things, uh, but then would use actual illusion magic in order to escape when he got caught scamming people out of their money. And his name was Job, because what else are you going to name a magician who's not that good at being magic? Um, and I think I think the character concept, the reason he ended up becoming an adventurer was because he, like, witnessed a murder. Basically, his his origin was just the plot of Sister Act. He witnessed a murder and had to flee. So, that was, yeah, I kind of miss Job. I loved Job. Did Job die? No, Job didn't die. I think the game just petered out. Which is just the worst fate. I would have loved to see Job die. A fate worse than death. And unfortunately, the most common fate. Yeah. What a tragedy. It's like the end of the never ending story. <laughs> it just kind of ended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Despite the title. <laughs> yeah. It's just like you cut off the bit where the luck dragon comes back. No one shouts, Moon Child. There you go. That's it. That's how TNT games end. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we talked about it a little bit but uh basically how did you first get involved with this group of players i know some of us kind of talked about it a little bit uh in some ways getting involved with this group of players for the, in some ways was kind of your first like D D game um well for me it was straight up random just like random people on roll 20 until got gathered enough people with similar play styles and whatever and went from there and that just amazes me that we've gotten such a good group of people together here starting that way internet randomness yeah so for me uh it's seraphina's fault swan's mm -hmm. fault and most things are she pulled me into this group and i'm eternally grateful for that uh for me it was klaus he was advertising for the second edition of the norathil game and uh, he was kind of setting stuff up with a couple of other random people that I don't think joined. But then he basically just got everybody from North of One uh, and then added on a couple of extra people, one of them being me. And yeah. I just remember, because <laughs> yeah, I was the Roll20 in this group, um, but pairing us down to what we have now, the, the cream of the crop. Um, I still remember when we were playing the Sick first... burn on everyone else who was involved. <laughs> Yeah, I hope they're not Sorry. listeners. That, that's, yeah. that's real shitty. If you are, I love you guys. Miss you. But when we first but not played, that much. there were two other people in the group who were not suitable for this group's play style. They weren't yes. suitable for yes. Dungeons and Dragons. I'm going to say it. I'll say it. Wait, are you I talking about Tent Smasher? Tent Smasher and Tent the Smasher. monk who doesn't know how to, how to do monk. anything. <laughs> Anyways, I remember we when had we had different play styles. Different play styles, and I remember when we put that down, and I just remember getting a message from my DM who I just met. And I was so nervous I was doing D and D wrong because I hadn't played, and I just get this message on roll twenty that just says "Hey," and I'm like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, "Here it comes." And so I click on it though, and then it was the exact opposite of what <laughs> it was the exact opposite of the pink slip, and I was like, "Oh," it was very touching to be like, "Yeah, you you fit in." And, we're going to do something else. It's nice. But I just still remember that moment of just, hey, and I'm like, oh, fuck, here we go. Yeah, I, as I said, joined in the North of One campaign. Um, was the only one that survived that whole thing. <laughs> um, one to the end. <laughs> but it was about my, like, third random roll 20. And the first from couple. From level one. From level one to 18, 17. I forget where we got to. Um, but, uh. No, I. you guys were all talking about how in the first one you ran, like, no one was doing character voices and whatever. I walked into these other two ones, like, 
full on. I was like, I'm gonna go for it, and if they don't like it, don't. And they didn't. <laughs> I was like, this is real awkward now. <laughs> no one else is doing anything. I'm just the weirdo of the group. This is great. This is great. Oh, you know what? I can't wait next week. I got real busy with school. Bye. <laughs> Dale, you want to tell your story of how you got to guest on episode 37? Yeah, my, my very chilling story. Basically, uh, Swan and I are Tumblr mutuals <laughs> and have been for a while. And I got a message that was like, hey, we have our live play show. Do you want to be a guest on it? And I said, yeah. And Swan said, well, go follow our DM on Twitter. And I did. And then we talked. <laughs> Thrilling adventures. Hello. You write a book. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna, and I'm gonna dedicate it to you. Hey. <laughs> I'm still amazed. A that Dale said yes because again, I've been watching your channel. This is me being a trying not to be like all Spanish, but like I've been watching your channel. No, for do it, do years. it. Be a like, fan. I don't know if it was my- right. <laughs> I don't know if it was just after you had left Geek and Sundry Blogs or, like, right as you were leaving and making your own channel, but right around then is when I started watching. Because um, I was subscribed to Geek and Sundry, and I was like, oh, fuck yeah, mythology videos? Hell yes, that's my jam. <laughs> <laughs> so I love mythology, and I love folklore and fairy tales and stuff, so I was like, this is perfect. So I've been watching well, you, your videos since then. You picked the best time. Yeah. Striking out on my own. I get creative freedom and whatever. Yeah, so I've just been watching your videos, and then I followed you on Tumblr, and you followed me back for whatever reason. I was like, oh, man, this is, she's so cool, though. Thanks. (laughs) And uh, and then I was like, all right, cool. Well, she reblogs things for me all the time. Maybe I can just reach out and see what's going on. Wait, you thought we were fake mutuals? No, I thought you were way too cool for me. I thought you were way too cool. Who are you? I only reblog stuff from you all the time. (laughs) Yeah, no, you just, you're super cool and have worked with Geek and Sundry and are just amazing and brilliant. And so I was like, I don't know. See, you calling me super cool, that's the evidence that uh, <laughs> we are internet friends. Because mm. I am not, I am a dork. <laughs> but then, it's also interesting. You're a super cool dork. Super cool dork. <laughs> and that's why you're so cool, is because you're a dork. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, but it's interesting because Nias and I, we talked a little last time of how we met, which is, I, was downloading mods for Skyrim and I wanted to get the become a bard mod. And I was like, I'm going to look up and see what songs are in this. And her let's role play series came up and I was like, a let's role play series. What is that? So I started watching Nias's videos and then commenting. And then we follow each other on Tumblr and now we're like really good friends. Amazing. And then I just found out that you and our friend Carrie, who we play D and D with, um, sometimes. We just played with yesterday. Which just freaks me out. It's so How does weird. the internet do this? How does it work? I remember I, I saw you reblog something about a one shot idea that she had just talked about in our last game. And I was like, wait a second. Just, it's the smallest world. So, uh, Dale, this one's actually from Klaus. And, uh, Klaus, if you want to, um, what's it called? extrapolate on the question that i have written down uh you can do so the question is uh when you guested for episode 37 uh did you have any thoughts about what the session would be like and if so what i had no idea what i was getting into like i i listened to uh the podcast to an extent i haven't caught up don't give me spoilers except for my episode because i know what happens then but, um, yeah, I'd listened, so I was sort of familiar with the characters. And then I just had basically a bunch of background information on the the specific area of the world we were going to be in and had no idea how in hell Klaus was going to make this work. Because, like, adding a player in to a group late or, like, for a one-off special thing, that's something that makes me panic. Hardcore. So to watch Klaus be really calm and just be like, Oh yeah, you know, um, yeah, the players are up to this now and they'll probably be at this place doing these things by the time we have your episode. He was so calm and I don't understand how it was kind of horror inspiring. Um, it's all fake. It's all of a sudden. Well, it's working. <laughs> Inside class is just like, really excited, yeah. Because it is, I, I was because I've done one offs before 
and I have this whole death house set up. And I'm like, this is awesome. This is great. There's a great story at the end of Twist. And then, but I played it before where people get halfway through it and don't finish it. And I'm like, that would be the worst to do a guest spot. And we get halfway through a plot. So I tried to make sure it was something we could finish in one night without well, you did a great job. forcing you. So <laughs> No, it's so good. It was so good. I just We made a trip into the freaking Baywilds? Like, hell yeah. You made fun of Simone's names? Perfect. Like, what is D&D without making fun of some, some well, names? Bradley. Brad and Chad. <laughs> My favorite villains. Yeah. God. <laughs> Since we're kind of talking about back to the story, what's the most unexpected way your character has changed from how you originally envisioned them? And Dale... Even though, I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about maybe Hunter. You had an idea for Hunter during episode 37. Maybe she came off a little bit differently than you were imagining. But And for those of us who have already answered, we can update our answers because it's been like yeah. almost a year. I have an absolute update. Yeah. Vespers is uh, her self-doubt. I, I did not. When I built her, I was like, I want a character who... It isn't necessarily arrogant in that she thinks she's the best ever, but that she doesn't give a shit about what other people think about her and is really just trying to look to her own standards. And then I realized, oh, no, she she gives the shit. She gives all of the shits. And as things evolved and she started realizing, you know, maybe I feel like I'm doing enough, but it doesn't ever seem to be enough for other people. That's where then the doubt started to come in. And now she really is looking at how others see her and is really, especially after the fight with Calvin and all of the stuff that happened in our first little arc where she bottled everything up and it didn't really work that way, <laughs> work that well for her. She's really trying to like connect with other people and be more emotionally conscious of how the things she says come across and how basically how she's interacting with others and what they do think of her. And yeah, it just, it's definitely very different from how I originally envisioned her. I cited my original <laughs> inspirations for her, which you will not understand. You know, from how she is now, it's impossible to see that it was, uh, it was Taco and Loop from the Adventure Zone. Like, I wanted her to have that very, like, haughty, you know, blase attitude, and it did not end up panning out that way. I think dying in episode two kind of threw a wrench in being above it all. <laughs> Death has an effect. Mm hmm. Sure does. So that would be mine. Uh, let's, let's hear from some of the people who didn't get a chance to answer this question last time. I was thinking I'd go last because there's, like, follow-ups about my character switch, but I can go into that if you'd like. Yeah, because you started off with Wink, uh, the Sverfneblin Arcane Archer, and then switched him out for Ezekiel. Yeah, so I came in with Wink. Uh, I had listened to the couple episodes of the, the podcast that you've done, but you guys had been playing, like, the pre-story for weeks before that that I wasn't involved in. So I was coming in late, and I l really liked Wink, but he didn't. I don't know. He didn't really mesh well. I felt like I was, I had made the party's dad that was also kind of a dick. And it was like, this isn't really, and he had no real reason to be there. I didn't connect him. I knew that the, the pilgrimage to Nymanet was going to be a big part of the story. And I was like, I have no idea why he'll stay. And then from a like meta perspective, I, he was, he played very similar to my last character, the warlock that I played for so very long, where like I mostly just, attack or Eldritch Blast, and then a couple times a day I have a cool thing that I can do. And I was like, I'm not very excited about this, he really doesn't fit, so then I asked if I could let him bow out and come with something else, so I brought in Ezekiel, and Ezekiel, I, I having actually been playing with you guys, I don't know, I wanted someone with a different perspective on the, the religion aspect of it, and uh... I don't know, I wanted someone that was more chaotic and maybe didn't give a shit as much. I, I don't know, there's a lot of very good-hearted, with the exception of Ellery, who has a bit of an edge, there's a, a lot of, like, a bit of goody-two-shoes at the party, and I was like, I want to be someone that starts shit, and, but, like, not in a way that wouldn't connect with them, so I still wanted him to be a very good and moral character, but at the same time, like, he is an agent of nature, and nature is unpredictable. Um, so yeah, I thought, I don't know, I thought it was fun to play with this idea of someone that has been fated by the gods from birth, and then kind of fucked it up, and we're only getting to how he did that now. 
but yeah, it's but I did not realize at the time that Calvin was going to be switching uh character classes. So uh I did not I might not have built sent in another paladin had I known that, but I'm really glad that it turned out because I really like playing Ezekiel. But I was hoping to go in I don't know. I didn't realize we were creating the Paladin Posse, but I'm really glad that we have because it worked out. Yeah, I think uh, I find it really interesting that we have three Paladins, but they play so differently. And they don't really like, like they mesh together and they don't really step on each other's kind of circle of it expertise. It helps that two are, uh, that two are multi-classed. <laughs> well, Calvin is like the traditional but how, the Paladin. How did Ezekiel, has he evolved, do you think, since your original uh I, I think so. I think I my overarching thing was I wanted to be an anarchist hippie. So like start whatever shit in every town that he comes to, but also be a very free love person. He's fit that mold a little bit better, but I think he's I don't know, a little bit less sure of himself and a little sadder than I had originally anticipated. That there is this kind of like a front that I didn't anticipate part of his personality was a front that it ended up coming out that way how about for calvin or whoever wasn't here or any of dale's characters where to begin what are we focusing on <laughs> someone repeat the question what's oh, the, how just, is he okay in? there's devil, there's levels i mean the adjusting to the character and the fact that he became paladin partially through the i i guess start by uh why did you decide to go from blood hunter to paladin it's kind of Mechanically speaking, I did not like the Blood Hunter. It was, uh, I actually, I guess I kind of connected to the, how he's kind of developed in my head at least, because I kind of envisioned and designed and developed and whatever, uh, Calvin originally as kind of an, a main character sort of thing. And it just, nothing was working. I didn't like, I didn't like the mechanics. There's such a big group so that when when he's trying to be diverse, he's like, he can hit stuff, but at the same time, he's supposed to be investigating stuff, and he's kind of an idiot, so that doesn't really work. So I just, it just wasn't working with what I wanted, and I was, I switched to Paladin because I wanted to be, I wanted to develop more of the side character, more of the, yeah, he's along for the ride, that's his goal. I didn't want to fight with Vesper anymore. <laughs> I think she would have been fine. <laughs> I will say I really liked how you took Klaus's Oath of Sacrifice. I really like that that still ties you to that Bloodhunter origin. I think that's really, well, that, really cool. Yeah, that that kind of, I mean, that part of the aspect never really changed. I wanted, originally, Calvin was, like, supposed, like that. his whole thing was he wanted to be a hero that he thought he would have to sacrifice himself to be that hero that that's kind of what would make a great hero somebody that would kind of give in to the darkness to fight for the light and being able to take on the oath of sacrifice it kind of still lets him do that but it's more of instead of fighting it's he's kind of even though he does a lot of, of slaying he is supposed to be a defender dale do you have anything for hunter I don't know, it's tricky with a character that's designed for a one-off thing. I suppose in terms of, you know, I just pulled from, I, I DM, anyone who DMs knows that you just have like a stack of characters sitting off to the side that you hope against hope one day you'll get to play and you never do. Um, and so Hunter was probably one of my least formed of those characters. Um, I knew I really wanted to try out the idea of an elf barbarian at some point because I, I loved the contrast of, you know, this, this figure of elegance, the epitome of elegance and coming in and just kind of ruining them a little bit. And so building that with Klaus was just so much fun. I, I, he put up with so much. I can't express to you how terrible a person I was as I was making this character because I I was busy and class was busy and I would just like not answer anything for weeks on end and then I'd come back and I'd be like, all right, I've decided. I wanted to bash <laughs> things up, um, which is not like super useful information. And it took me until really late in the game to work out what kind of a character she was. I, I I guess I envisioned her originally as, I think I phrased it as being um, the main character from Jumanji. Like he was this kid from like a rich background who was kind of a dweeb. And then he spent 
you know, 30 years living alone in the jungle and having to survive. And that was the original character concept, which kind of, I guess the biggest change was that she mellowed out. Instead of being completely manic, she was a little bit more like blasé about everything uh, and just just needed to like slow things down a bit. I like that she was completely content to like hunt rabbits in the forest and not deal with things that come into bars, but here we are. Like, just, just how about I stay away from people? Because that's where the trouble seems to be. She's not wrong. <laughs> you know, Hunter, Hunter was really fun. Yeah, It was I my love- first time playing a barbarian. So, oh man, getting to smash I loved, I loved how she and Ball, like, connected. That was so great. Yeah. So, oh, my heart. I was like, I have a friend. And I love seeing Roger, like, get to step up in that session as well. Because... The Paladin Posse, or, well, Ezekiel can, you know, have heavier moments, but, like, Calvin and Ball especially tend to stand back, so I really like getting to see, unless we're, like, in a fight, so I really like getting Ball to see, like, step forward. It was so um, nice. It was so much fun. Play too. It was so nice, yeah. Ellery? Yeah. Uh, so, with Ellery, I, last time, I think what I talked about for this question was that Ellery is a much more vulnerable character than I originally imagined her to be. Like, she still definitely has walls, but there are doors in those walls, and they're not that hard to find. Um, she's a softie. <laughs> she's, she's a lot more outwardly expressive in her emotions than I expected her to be originally, though there's still quite a bit that she's keeping under wraps. But I think... The the biggest thing that has changed for her from where I originally imagined her besides that is this sense of compassion that she's developing. She still has a little bit of a hard time of it. And she, she started out kind of like looking at especially Calvin and Ball and trying to figure out what it was that prompted them to care about other people outside of their own circle of friends and family. But then when Orizana came into the story, that really kind of, it was like it flipped a switch for her. She suddenly understood why people could care in a way that she hadn't understood before. So I love that, Orizana, by the way. Oh, I love... <laughs> She's been geez. delightful as yes. a NPC, because we've been escorting her, but we chose to do it, and she hasn't been, like, a damsel in distress the whole time, which is very yeah. nice. Mostly because I forget she's there. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Whatever you're doing, it works. <laughs> uh, Amson? Yeah, I think uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on Amson because Amson doesn't like talking about himself. But part of me jokingly wants to say, no, Amson is exactly how I envisioned him, which is only mostly true. Uh, but the number one thing that, that developed unexpectedly for Amson is uh, how afraid of failure he is. Partially because, you know, episode two, he stood back while everybody else went to go after Calvin. He showed up last, he was late, and everything went to shit. <laughs> and he kind of feels responsible for that. And, but more recently, his silence surrounding Vesper. And he recognized that he failed. And yeah, just being afraid of not measuring up, I guess. I didn't expect him to develop that. Which is hilarious, because I just listened back to three and went, man, Vesper's such a bitch sometimes. <laughs> and she really is. Like, I, I impartially, she really is a bitch. <laughs> I will say, I kind of built Ezekiel to be a counterpoint to Vesper as the other, like, mm-hmm. divine caster in the party. I was like, Vesper's so reserved and, like, a little bit haughty. I mean, and Ezekiel is kind of a snob, too, but... uh it's in a, like, boisterous and, like, give me everything kind of way that I wanted, and like, Vesper's. He's kind of a snob towards snobs. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really, really fun. Yeah, no, I definitely, outside of, out of character, have the awareness of being like, God, she's such a bitch. <laughs> and there have been times where I'm like, you know what would be the worst possible thing to say right now? I'm going to say that. <laughs> hey, all I can say is you're playing your charisma very well. Oh, God. She has worse charisma than my last Northville character, which is saying a lot. <laughs> uh, so, what? Hmm? Well, I have a character. Sure. Change. Oh. 
a ton, which is fun. This is a short story there. Um, I played a character named Ormaniac, and he was a bartender rogue. And his whole design was like, I want to be Gilmore, but like laid back and a bartender. That was it. I was going to be Gilmore the bartender. But except I was named Gil, I was named Armaniac and I was a tiefling. But I was watching House of Cards at the time. And so instead of Gilmore, I was Frank Underwood. And I <laughs> turned into this deliciously evil tiefling. That's not that Gilmore. Burned houses down and was manipulative. It was not like, kind of like Gilmore's voice, but in like a manipulative, evil way. It was really fun to play, but not what I was expecting at all. I loved him. That was great. Next question kind of goes into it because we're talking about we're talking about our our own characters, but also talking about how we find it interesting our points of other characters. Um, what's one thing that you especially like about another player's character? And I have one in mind. If uh, you guys don't mind me going first, go for it. One of my, I think I can speak for most of us in saying that Ball is a absolute precious gem of a character. My favorite thing about Ball that I especially like about him is not necessarily his innocence. I don't think that's the right word because I don't think he's really innocent anymore. But how he always looks for the best in everybody at first at first um exposure to them and he lets them prove that they are that they are bad people. He always assumes that they're good until they prove otherwise and that's Probably, that's the biggest thing that I enjoy most about Ball. Unlike the rest of us who are just deeply suspicious of <laughs> everyone. Plug in Klaus's bird meme with the with the coffee <laughs> salesman. Yeah, well, okay. Listen. <laughs> if if he had been evil though, then it would have been like, well, maybe you guys should have checked better. So we couldn't win either way. <laughs> that's true. You know, DMs give you shit for being too suspicious, or they're like, maybe you should have been more suspicious. So I will say that Calvin's sheer dumb sincerity is my favorite thing. (laughs) And hats off to Michael for finding a way to, like, play this character in such a way that he is a moron, but often the most insightful and, like, great thing. I know we, like, cut Calvin off a lot, and I love (laughs) but, like, honestly, when Calvin steps forward to handle something... It's George's favorite, even of like he's he's gonna get us killed. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say Calvin too, but for a different reason, because there's been lots of big moments for the other characters, emotional or otherwise, and Calvin's has had those, but they've been subtle. Like even his taking his oaths has been was been a pretty low key event compared to some of the other events for other characters that were equally as important for the character. But, you know, he did it with his friends went around, and here he was taking an oath to protect his friends. And I'm like, yes, I love this. He's building this character. And I'm excited to see where it all goes. Hopefully not to a TPK, but, you know, watch out next session. I've tried it before. Maybe maybe next time it'll stick. <laughs> it did once, and then none of us were happy. <laughs> um... I, I think I, I think I talked about Calvin last time, so this time I'm going to uh, say something about Ezekiel, our newest party member. And this is something that Ellery appreciates about him a lot too: is that he is so <laughs> he he is so like compassionate. And again, that that's an influence on Ellery at this point. He he wants to do good things and help people everywhere he goes. But at the same time, he also has a very strong sense. Like, he is willing to make a judgment uh, and say, no, this is wrong. And it's... I am very distracted by the chat again. Thank you for that, right. you guys. Um, um, so for the listeners, there's been several ref- references to Ezekiel and Ellery's boning. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... So it's like that the the fact that he he is very clear on what he considers right and wrong, but at the same time he is very compassionate and understanding. Um I just I just really like that kind of balance that he strikes. Well that's exactly what I was gonna say, so somebody else go. <laughs> uh I'll say from the outside, being someone who's like coming in and just watching another group work, which is always fascinating. 
uh, like something that I love about all of your characters and the way that you play, like on a meta level, is just how willing you all are to lean into change. So like you, you build your characters and you have attachments to them and how to play them, but you very sort of carefully will let them grow and change and react to each other and the way that you want them to, to end up interacting. And I mean, sometimes it's less subtle. Sometimes, you know, you, you change from a blood hunter to a paladin, but it's, you know, it's a fascinating thing to watch a group that is like, ah, yeah, I'm going to create a character as a foil to another character in the group, or I'm going to let my character soften up a bit because that's how this should work, building up against these other people. It's just really cool. I think a lot of that comes from the fact that this group of characters is really a family, how they all grew up together and they all care about each other so deeply that they are willing to make changes for each other that they probably wouldn't be willing to make for anybody else. I would take that a step further and say, uh, as players, we kind of have a similar feeling. Um, having been around a few blocks with groups, uh, shit don't always work out well. And, uh, I mean, I, we kind of committed to be together. So I think it's, it's, it's really important for us to, even if it's subconsciously to kind of work stuff out and blend together. I've had a lot of groups that, that did not work out that way. And uh, if we ever meet each other in a dark alley, somebody's getting shanked, is all I'm saying. I was about to say that you'll warm my heart, and then it ended with a shanking. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. The most direct way to finish I have to find something else to say. Because I was absolutely going to say something about Melly. I don't know, I see a lot of Melly, though. It's hard, because I love everything that she is. I love her... You hate her, I'm not telling that. No, I no. <laughs> I love the juxtaposition between the quiet no, nerd who sits in a library all the time and then the one who, like, throws herself off a cliff. I really like the juxtaposition of how Melly always seems to be, like, sitting there observing and then will suddenly go, okay, I've, I've, I've observed the situation and I know what I want to do. Hold my beer, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> when she agreed with Ezekiel that I forget what captive we were considering gonna, murdering, and she's like, yeah, yeah, we should kill him. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like yes, thank God. Yeah. There's another practical person in the book. <laughs> so great. Like, I love that. About, I do love that about Melly, that she does have that juxtaposition of like quietly sitting there watching everything happen. She takes in all the information and then goes, I'm going to do this. She's our big bad. You know that's going to happen. Yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I, that'll be mine because I really wanted to say, yeah, I love Ezekiel's conviction. I really like that. So I will. That's my thing. Next question. Hey, did Michael color. answer for that one or am I just forgetting? Oh, did he? Michael, did you answer? Yes. I can't hear you. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, I, no, I don't think you did. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm really. I, I, I don't know what it is, but I feel like, how do I phrase this? I'm not hitting on you, uh, Alexander, but, uh, something about Amson, the way you play Amson, it feels so appropriate to me. I feel like the charisma that uh, Amson has has really kind of suckered me in. Like, if I'm gonna, I don't know, I just want to be around him all the time. I, I like, I like his dedication to his stories and just the way he approaches He's kind of like the, 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 to steal it from Fina, the, the mom of the group in a, in a lot of ways. I mean, he's, he's a voice of reason when it comes to a lot of stuff. And, and at the same time, it's just like, you know, you want to throw your arm around him and, and at the same time, just be there with him. Well, thanks, man. Yeah. Anton, I think is the one person in the group I would be most likely to be friends with if I knew him in real life. I can, yeah, yeah no, I agree. Either Amson or Ball. <laughs> Only because Ball's like just quiet. And Everybody's friends. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I could see myself getting along with Ezekiel or Ellery. I specifically cannot. In my life, but <laughs> sometimes when I'm talking, I will watch Michael's face just to see how like pissed mm -hmm. off he's getting at what <laughs> Ezekiel is saying. <laughs> uh -huh. 
I think Michael might hate me in real life. <laughs> no, that's just it. I if if I were to date anybody out of this group, it's George. I I hate Ezekiel with a passion. Oh no! As almost as much as Madison. Oh, great. Out! Wow. <laughs> That's a big statement right there. <laughs> Madison is an NPC in the in yeah, yeah the Tuesday game that George that I was George like runs. George, I love you, baby. You're you're the best. But any character you've ever played, <laughs> suck my dick. Oh man, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and not yeah. the same way that you can. So. I have found apparently a niche with like characters that you just despise in every way. <laughs> uh. Uh, I really want to say quick, uh, something quick about Hunter, um, that Fina kind of said already. Uh, and then we can, we can take a bit of a break because it's at the normal halfway mark. Um, but I want to say about Hunter that, you know, Hunter was in for a single session that went just a little bit longer than it normally does, but a single session nonetheless. But, you know, we're, we're a party of a bunch of holy rollers and, you know, Hunter was just a elf barbarian who just wants to live her life and not bother with everybody else. But even though she hates people, <laughs> she meshed really well with the group uh, for that one session. She, Aww. you know, Ball and Hunter got along extremely well. Ball was just like, oh, what do you hunt? And Hunter was like, uh, how do I even answer this? I hunt. What are you talking about? And yet, Somehow they just worked together really, really well. That's really nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I want the the ball and hunter bromance spinoff at some point. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. yeah, them going and solving crimes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that might be the only reason why Ellery did not actually start something with Hunter in the middle of combat on the uh, on the bridge. <laughs> ball is my shield. It's like. Well, but Ball likes her, so I can't make him sad. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just a lot of fun to see what would happen with a new character, especially one that we knew that was temporary, metagaming, but one that, like, by her very nature was not like us at all, but still meshed really well for for that time. I liked it. It was fun. It's like reading a, a, a good crossover comic. You're like, yeah. why can't they just hang out all the time? Right? They have to go back to their own lives. Why can't they just hang out all the time? Mm -hmm. yeah, the, so Hunter does want to just come back and hang out with us forever and always. <laughs> so she's more than welcome. She'll just show up sometimes and they'll be yeah. like, why are you here? I don't know. I was wondering. I showed up. <laughs> yeah. No, it'd be great to have you again sometime. I would love that. Well, it's our it's our normal break time, so um, we'll say probably fifteen minutes should be good, and then we can come back. And this is uh where we'll really start getting into the listener questions. Like the next, I don't know, twenty questions are all listener questions. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess a break for fifteen minutes, and we'll come back afterwards. For part two of this episode of Back to the Story, you can find it on Stitcher, Google Play, Player FM, or TuneIn. We also have a YouTube channel called Back to the Story, an actual play podcast. If you'd like to support the show, feel free to buy us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash backtothestory.